So uh, welcome back to this uh, seminar series from the from our Mobilize D project. I'm Claudia Mazzai, a professor of biomechanics uh, at the University of Sheffield. Uh, and I'm also the work package leader of the technical development work package of Mobilize D. Mobilize is, um, is a, a European effort uh, that is aiming at connecting digital mobility assessment to clinical outcomes for regulatory and clinical endorsement. It's a five years project funded by uh, the EU, uh, I, under the umbrella of the EU uh, uh, IMI2 initiative in collaboration with the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries. It's a five year project that started in April 2019 and is uh, aiming at finishing in. Uh, at the end of March 2024. We have a lot, it's a very large consortium, including pharmaceutical companies, uh, public institutions, SMEs, and, and technology partners. And our uh, leader is, uh, is Professor Lynn Rochester from the University of Newcastle, together with uh, Dr. Rubenov from Novartis. We know, uh, if you have listened to our introductory video, uh, that the physical mobility is really uh, uh, the, the, the reason why we, this effort has been put together. Uh, by physical mobility, we mean the ability to move freely and easily without assistance uh, in the environment, which of course is something that becomes problematic with aging. And as, uh, one of the main issues that we have when dealing with mobility and, and, and trying to understand mobility and its consequences is that of having the right tools to, uh, to, to measure mobility itself. In Mobilize, what we are uh, focusing on is the measurement of a specific domain of mobility, which is the mobility performance. Uh, we are interested in measuring what happens and how our patients move when they are out, of, out and about in the real world. And to do the, this, we are using uh, a device agnostic approach where we are locating a sensor on the uh, pelvis of of, of, of subject on the lower back. And we have established a, a series of minimum criteria that this device needs to uh, satisfy. And once we uh, have the, the, the measurements that come from this device, including accelerometers and gyroscopes data for uh, sample at 100 Hertz, we then use a series of algorithms to extract our digital mobility outcomes. Uh, if you have seen our first um, session, that was all about the algorithms. If you have, if you have missed it, uh, feel free to, to, to watch the, 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 the video, the recording of the session on, the, on our YouTube channel. Uh, once we have these algorithms, the next step is that mm, we want to uh, validate them. And in particular, we have de developed uh, a, a, a multifactorial approach to the technical validation of BMOs in, uh, in uh, Mobilize, where we look separately at three aspects. One is the device, and as I said, we, we, where we establish the minimum requirements needed from a, from a, uh, from a device, that, uh, from an IMU to be used for our purposes. Uh, we want to establish separately the accuracy and reliability of our DMOs uh, specifically for every disease of interest. And then, of course, we want to you know, account also for the, uh, for the input that comes from the users, uh, and both in terms of the assessors and the patients that need to be involved in the assessment of mobility. Um, we have seen in the second seminar, which are the experimental tools that we're using in this process, you have seen how they are pretty complex <laughs> because uh, we, 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 we are going to follow our patients in, in a series of environments. And uh, what you will, we will be talking today, uh, we will what we will be talking about today is how we went on and used this, uh, all, the, all the sensors and tools that we have uh, seen in the previous session. And in particular, we will guide you through the, uh, the study protocol and the journey that our patients had to go through. Um, and which entailed a number of different stages, but also through the, we will talk about the journey that our assessors had to follow. We started in January 2020. This is a multi-centric study. Uh, in Sheffield, we had a, a, three, a first training session where we're covering all the different uh, aspects related to this protocol. Uh, then we had a couple of uh, key people that started traveling around Europe to uh, train the, the different labs and the other labs involved. So they went to Newcastle and Kiel in February when they were still, uh, February 2020, they were still all smiley and happy. Uh, 
things became a bit tricky when they arrived in Stuttgart, uh, where the for the first time they had to go through a COVID test and wear a mask, which is something that we all were pretty not familiar with at that stage. And still they managed to uh, to train the local team and, 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 and complete uh, that, that, that initial part of the project. And then of course we were, they, 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 they could only dream about flying also to, the, to our fifth uh, lab in Tel Aviv. And this is where we, uh, we really uh, we were hit quite hard by, by by the arrival of COVID with the with all the studies planning to start in April, in April uh, 2020. So what you would hear today is, is really also the, the assessor's journey and how they had to adjust to make sure that everything we did was safe both for our, for for, for uh, our patients and for our assessors. Um, we will also hear a little bit about the uh how we, we dealt with the data management and data policy assessment to make sure that everything that we were doing would satisfy the requirement of our uh of our idea of working towards the regulatory approval for also for the technical validation of our dmos and what these entail in practical terms and finally we will give you a first uh, uh taste of, of the data that we have managed to collect uh, and and where we are with the current data set uh, before I leave the stage to, to the speakers, just a reminder that this is that everything that you hear today uh, is, of course, our own opinion and, is, and not that of our sponsors. Uh, we will have a few Q and A sessions. Feel free to pop in your questions in the chat, and we will uh, we will uh, address them uh, as possible. And without any further ado, I will just leave the stage to our first speaker, who is Clint Hansen from the Neurogeriatric Skill. So, Clint. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, my name is Clint Hansen. I'm working at the University of Kiel, and I'm part of the Neurogeriatric Skill team. And I was lucky enough to be part of this technical validation study um, for Mobilize. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the technical validation study patient, but also assessor journey. So you have to imagine once you come to us to one of the assessment centers, I would call them, uh, we do different tasks, but first of all, we are starting with the consent and the screening and the participant characterization. This is what I will talk mainly about. And then the following speakers will continue with the in-lab assessment, real world assessment, the interviews, and also the two and a half free living assessment. So the first slide is, or this slide is something that you will actually see multiple times today because it gives a very nice overview about what we did with the patients, but it also um, shows how much work has been put into this whole project just to make uh, it work from the beginning. So let me start with the consent and the screening. So as you heard before, we had different screening sites. So obviously we had to get the consent form in various languages and had to apply not only to the local ethical board, but also had to talk to the sponsor to make sure that everything was always uh, correct and that we had everything uh, covered in terms of consent and data protection GDPR wise. So what we did is first of all, we had the consent form that was uh, signed and uh, ticked by our participants. And then as Claudia already mentioned, COVID hit and every university and every country had different COVID regulations. So for us, it was relatively easy in Kiel, I have to admit. So we just had to put two additional COVID screening um, documents in that patients were then allowed to participate if they were obviously negative. So then we, <clears throat> just to walk you through the whole uh, concept form and also to the descriptives. So before we even started measuring any of our participants, we got descriptives and consent I already talked about from all of them. So we made sure that we collected everything from the beginning so that we have a very, very clear understanding of our participants and of our different cohorts. Each uh, assessment center or each site had to recruit more or less 24 people or participants uh, from the various uh, disease. Uh, we had proximal femur fractures, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and chronic heart failure, but also um, healthy older adults. So depending on which side you were, we recruited different participants. 
And then one of the first things we did with our uh, participants was we did the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And if they passed, if I remember correctly, we had over 16, the inclusion criteria, then we moved to the next steps. So as I said before, depending on which cohort you were in, different questions were asked because the um, diseases are obviously very, very different from one each other. So I'm not going through all of them, but as you can see, for example, in the um, MS participant uh, descriptive, we asked for the diagnosis of MS based on the revised McDonald's criteria. The clinicians uh, in the audience will exactly know what I'm talking about the others they have to ask in the Q&A. Um, so we actually made sure that all our participants were really part of the cohort that we wanted them to be in. And once we have done that, we moved further on and we asked about the living arrangements. So for example, if they were living alone or with someone, and then also and what kind of housing they were living, apartment, independent living unit, or even uh, just a small apartment. We asked about the medication. That is a very, very important part because depending on the medication, we can actually walk or behave completely different. So just to make sure that we assessed all of this, we asked for the medication, but also for the frequency. We asked about the fall history, which is very important for us because depending how many falls you have, depending your this depends also how bad or good you can actually walk and we also made sure that during the in-lab assessment we always had someone who made sure that um, in case you were unstable um, but Lisa is going to talk about that afterwards so we asked about the fall history and then also if you're using if the participants used any uh, walking aids that is also important because walking aids actually change our walking behavior and then we distinguished also between indoors and outdoors. We wanted to know if you use them only indoors or also outdoors. And once we had covered that part, then we moved further and we talked about uh, the later life function and the disabilities that may occur or that you may that the purchaser may had. And as you see, it's a 32 item questionnaire that asks about how you go through your everyday life. So how things are moving on. So for example, first one, F1 is unscrewing the lid of a previously unopened jar without using any devices. This is, just gives us a very good idea how good you can handle your everyday life. And the participants were asked that before we started with the real assessments. Um, then we started asking about the cohort dependent, uh, so the cohort specific um, items. So we always had uh, the visual analog scale where we asked how much pain they were feeling in general, but also while they were walking. Then we had each cohort had specific uh, clinical assessments. I'm not going to read them, but uh, just to give you an idea that for each cohort, we had a specific set of clinical assessment that had to be done prior to the in-lab assessment or real-world assessment, or then even the two and a half hour living assessment. So depending on the cohort, we had specific clinical assessment. So you imagine that even before we started assessing our patients or participants, we already had quite a bit of uh, documents and questionnaires before we even started getting hands-on. So now, that's the fun part for me, at least. So this was the initial slide. This is, we start with a consent, we get the participant, we characterize, and then we go into the in-lab assessment, real-world assessment, and so on. But then COVID was already there. And then we realized really quickly that the plan that we initially had makes a lot of sense on paper, but in reality, it did not fit. So we had to make sure that all our assessments would still work. But in order to do this, we had to be very, very flexible. So we had a lot of discussions. And on the top part here, you see the original assessment. But then what we had to do, because for example, in Kiel, we were allowed to uh, recruit during the COVID 
during the hard COVID times also from the ward. So sometimes we had to switch the order of the assessments just because otherwise we would not be able to recruit any patients or participants at all. So that would mean that we would start with uh, the two and a half hour assessment or the home assessment, which was the one week assessment with a McRobert sensor on the lower back, which we hear later about. But just to give you an idea that we had to be very, very flexible throughout the whole time doing the assessment. And that is just for the patient or the participant. But let's just quickly talk about the assessors. So in this case, me, or we will hear from Lisa later and Kirsty and Alan. Um, so for us, as Claudia mentioned before, there was the initial part in Sheffield, but it goes way back when we designed the protocol. I think it was also during the ISPGR in, uh, I think, where was it, in Edinburgh? So where we started with everything and then we had many, we wrote manuals for everything, for the constant, for the participant characterization, for the in-lab, for everything we had manuals and user guides. And the assessors had to make sure that they not only understood, but also used all tools in order to get clean and good data. So that is very, very important to understand that the assessors had a lot of work prior to the study, but throughout the study also, because if we switched the order, that meant also that we had to switch a lot of different things and talk to different parts to upload the data, which we will hear later um, from uh, David. So there was a lot of work that went into the assessment from us. But then also, in order to hear from the participant characterization, we also needed a clinician and the clinician had to do all those tests because just as a researcher like me, for example, I cannot do those clinical tests. So we had to get always people in during the COVID times that was especially complicated to get them in. But then also we in Kiel all the way up north in Germany and we had patients when we visited them at home, for example, we had no phone connection. So the Wi-Fi did not really work, nothing worked. So we had to switch sometimes from the digital assessment with our tablets that we used for the assessment to paperback. So lucky enough, we discussed this before that just in case if something goes wrong, we always had the paperback. So, and just a fun fact, we saw the picture in the beginning where Stefano and Kirsty were flying to Kiel and we got the first good understanding of how the systems work and how the lab is and how we can start with our participants. But then it was planned that Kirsty flies around again and helps us with the first measurements. So I have down here Zoom and WhatsApp, the two icons, because for me, that was the most valuable tool. All the troubleshooting that we had to go through throughout this assessor participant journey was really based on WhatsApp. And I have no idea how many WhatsApp messages I sent to all the people that are involved in the assessment because we had to figure out ways to make this whole thing work and it was a very very fun experience but it was also we had to be very flexible and i think the very few minutes that i had to talk to you now are just to give you a quick understanding that the assessor and the participant they had a very very interesting journey a very flexible journey and with that i let you uh hear about the in-lab assessment from uh, Lisa, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about the in-lab protocol, which, which Clint has already sort of started to speak a little bit about. Um, so I manage the, the technical validation study data collection in lab at, at Newcastle um, and want to just talk about our experiences through that process. So the same figure again, you're probably going to see it for each of the starts of the presentation. Just as a reminder, I'm going to, to take the button from Clint and, and talk about the in-lab assessment. And in particular, focus on, on the challenges really that we've faced and, and also the solutions that we developed to overcome them. So first of all, let's talk about the protocol design. Um, the protocol design was, was um, constructed very carefully in order to try to be able to simulate as best as we can real world challenges within the lab. And by that, what I mean is that we needed to be able to challenge mobility um, in a variety of different ways by pro 
proposing different functional tasks to uh, the patients that came to see us. So first of all, we had a straight walking assessment. This is probably the most common assessment that you'll find in the clinic or, or research labs. Um, but we asked the participants to, to complete the task three different times um, at three different speeds. So starting off at a self-selected slow speed, a self-selected preferred speed, and then finalizing with two walks at a self-selected fast speed. Then we went on to, to diversify a little bit as to what we're looking at. So we performed a tug test, which was more a measure of performance here. Um, so the tug test is uh, usually performed at a comfortable speed, but in our scenario, we asked participants to perform it as quickly as they possibly could. The tug test is very different from just straight walking for a number of reasons, but, but mainly it incorporates those postural transitions but also a 180 degree turn around a cone in addition to, to the straight walking that we've already captured. The L test is, is an interesting um, test that was our next protocol that we asked participants to, to, to complete. So participants began in a seated position, very much like the, the tug test, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. They were asked to stand up and walk around the outside of the first cone that was directly ahead of them four meters away. So around the outside of that cone, making a, a 90 degree left hand turn. They were then asked to walk to the next cone, which was two meters directly ahead of them, perform a 180 degree turn to the left, walk back towards the first cone and then return to the chair. And this test was more a test of functional um, ability, if you like, because we asked them to do it at a self-selected uh, pace. And what's nice about it is it com combines very much um, a lot of the aspects that we've already assessed in, in straight walking and tug test, um, but combines them all into a single test. So you've got a combination of different turns, of different uh, magnitudes and in different directions, as well as the, the postural transitions and straight walking. When we try to simulate in the lab, uh, there's a couple of components that are really important that we often don't capture very well. And those two components relate to, to the environment, but also to the complexity of the environment and the complexity of the task. So the next two tasks here, um, the surface test and the hallway test, try to um, look at different aspects of the environment that we might encounter. So the surface test involved participants walking, uh, completing two circuits around the circuit uh, that's marked on the screen here. On one side of the circuit, so on one straight of the circuit, uh, participants just walked over the, the lab floor. On the other side of the circuit, there was a carpet. Um, so this was designed to really have a look to see how uh, digital, digital mobility outcomes change depending on the, the surface characteristics of the floor. And if there are any changes there that affect walking patterns that would be useful when we're refining the algorithm for the real world. Next, the hallway test or the step test, which seems a more intuitive name to me, um, involves participants walking up and down again, but this time they had to step up and step down over a, a platform um, that was distributed or that was positioned four meters away from the start position. So this task encapsulates the step up, the step down, and also a turn as well, as well as some other straight walks. So again, we're beginning to build different combinations of different tasks um, in different levels of difficulty, different environments, um, and hopefully being able to, to stress uh, the mobility response of, of our patients in different ways. Lastly, and probably the most difficult task of all was the simulated daily activity protocol at the end of the session. So this is, is a fairly complicated protocol, please bear with me. Um, it's depicted as a, as a picture on the far right of your screen. Um, it involves beginning in a seated position and walking around the lab, which has been made up to look like someone's studio apartment, if you like. So um, there's a kitchen area with a table and a chair and some cutlery and, and a place setting for someone to eat and sit down. There's also other uh, challenges, for example, the cones that are in the middle of the room here, which participants were required to snake around. And there was also uh, an obstacle or, or um, a line on the floor that participants had to step over. And there was lots of other um, tasks involved in this particular protocol. We were encouraged to engage with the participants, so to have a, a chat with them um, whilst they stood and, and 
stood still or, or equally whilst they sat down and had a meal. So if you want to know further information about the, the protocol, um, Claudia published that protocol very recently in BMJ Open and the, the DOR is on the bottom of the screen there. Ultimately, this task um, incorporates a whole variety of different manoeuvres. So you've got walking, you've got veering as you snake through the cones, you've got turning of different degrees and angles, um, sitting and standing transitions, so moving from sit into standing and stand into sitting, reaching and bending. You've got different cognitive uh, difficulties within the task as participants talk to you, um, uh, sorry, as the, the researcher talks to the participant. And ultimately, it combines a series of functional tasks that participants would complete in their own home, whether they're stood having a conversation with somebody or sat having a meal, for example. And during this protocol, it's quite a long protocol with lots of different stages. So we were providing uh, instructions to participants throughout the course of, of the protocol. And, and in a couple of slides time, I'm going to talk a little bit about why that was quite challenging um, in COVID times. The other benefit of this particular trial that was factored in was we were expecting a variety of different patients of different capabilities and capacities. Not only have we got different patient cohorts with different uh, disease symptoms and conditions, but also we've got a lot of variation within a patient cohort as well. So some individuals might have quite mild symptoms, whereas other individuals might have more moderate to, to severe symptoms. And so what we had, particularly in this task here, was the option of making it more difficult or less difficult. So um, on the final walk back to the chair, participants were asked to, to bend down and, and pick up some cones. But for example, this element of the task was very difficult in particular for, for individuals post hip fracture. So it was important to factor in this leniency, if you like, in the protocol to enable participants to achieve exactly what they were able to without putting them at any undue risk of, of, uh, of being unsafe. We also incorporated some additional trials. So I, I've talked about the, the different protocol trials that were involved in, in the lab, but we also repeated some of these trials with uh, different sensor attachment types. So waist-worn sensors very, um, compared to, to body-worn sensors as well. So Clint has, has already uh, nicely touched on the, the preparation leading up to, to the clinical trial and to delivering those protocol um, uh, protocols that I've talked about in the, in the last couple of slides. These two pictures here, um, so the top one is taken in Kiel in Germany in February 2020 and, and actually forms part of a blog that, that Kirsty wrote based on her travels um, training up the, the individual sites. Um, and the bottom picture is a, a training session that was taking place in, in the lab here in Newcastle. March 2020 was when COVID, COVID struck. So these two uh, photos were very much the last opportunities of training that we had face to face before we were in a lockdown pandemic situation. And so beyond this point, face to face training was very much restricted to virtual and online training. We had a very substantial manual which uh, supplemented researchers at individual sites to be able to set up the equipment and make sure that it functioned and, and worked correctly. There were lots of changes that had to be made over the course of, of the assessment uh, period and I'm going to talk a little bit about those changes in, in the next couple of slides. Um, but the manual very much uh, progressed and evolved um, and that was something that we very much had to keep on top of over the course of, of the of the of the data collection we were working within a time when it capabilities were already pretty stretched so whether we were based in a hospital or university institution um you know workforces were were being directed to work at home um so it support um on individual sites was was challenged really um, and not performing at the level that maybe it would have previously so getting the support and getting uh, solutions to problems, um, admin, IT access and things like that was all much more difficult. Clint's already touched upon this, but I think it's important to, to raise it again. We had to really think about support structures for research sites and, and clinical centres. So how did we communicate effectively? How did we meet regularly without overburdening people? But how did we also make sure that, the, that there were those kind of... Uh, Claudia likes to call them the end of the line, those emergent phone calls where literally 
all that you need is someone to pick up the phone and talk to you about the issues that you're having and try to implement a solution as quickly as possible. Often we had patients in the lab, um, patients at this time, even more so are particularly precious. Getting them to come and see us during a COVID pandemic was, was enough of a challenge as it is. So we were very, very keen to, to keep every single patient that was willing to come and see us and, and collect as much data as we possibly could. So that was one thing that was, was critical to the success of this trial. Lastly, I haven't really touched upon the, the equipment as part of my presentation for today, but, but you'll have heard in previous webinars as well that the technical validation study was incredibly intensive, both from a data collection point of view, both from a, you know, a international consortium point of view, but, but more so than anything, a, a technological point of view. So making sure that we had all of the different equipment, making sure that it worked correctly, making sure that it talked to each other, and making sure that, that we used it in the, in the most uh, proper way. By far, this study has been the most technologically intensive study I've ever been involved in. Um, so I've not got too much uh, more left to talk to you about. This is my final slide. And I just wanted to, to touch upon some of the real difficulties that we had, or not difficulties, huge challenges, in fact, in terms of the, the protocol and, and just some of the ways that, that we overcame them. So first of all, we're dealing with a multi-component system. I've already just mentioned we've got um, the different inertial measurement units. We've got a series of high-speed infrared cameras, as well as pressure insoles, distance sensors, every sensor that we could possibly find. I think we almost used it. There are obviously a huge amount of difficulties in, in integrating multiple components within a system in terms of hardware and software, in terms of connectivity. And the, the team in uh, Sassari designed the, the customized synchronization uh, and trigger box, which was really pivotal, critical, in fact, for us to be able to, to operate all of these systems simultaneously. The next thing that I think is really important as part of this trial, we needed to be a multi-site trial to be able to have the expertise, to be able to have the reach for the clinical cohorts and patients. Um, and that obviously brings its own challenges, even in a, in a, a a non-COVID time. One of the, the things that relates to, to the difficulties or challenges in terms of uh, equipment, which I think Kirsty's already spoke about previously, is working across the multiple sites, the multiple different systems, um, and how we adopt a consistent process across those sites to make sure that the data we're collecting is, is not only robust and accurate, but consistently accurate across those sites too. Um, and if you're interested to find out a little bit more about the, the quality control um, procedures that we adopted to ensure a high quality calibration prior to each session, then you can check out the, the recently published paper in census. Lastly, this data is, is being used to refine algorithms um, that will be used out in the real world. And so it was critically important that we had a high um, quality of data across all sites, across all patient groups. Um, and so we took a very pragmatic approach to um, ensuring data quality. We recorded all of the sessions so we can use video data to go back and have a look at the any anomalies that we might find in our data. Um, Stefano and, and Kirsty both made a huge variety of different GUIs um, implemented within MATLAB and, and other programming softwares that I'm not familiar with, but in order to help and ensure that automated processing um, across different sites, making sure that it was done consistently and to a, a very high standard as well. So without further ado, I'm, oh, I've got one more slide, apologies. So lastly, I just want to talk about some of the adjustments that we made, both in terms of the site, but also the protocol, um, which Clint's previously uh, touched upon very briefly. So when we went into lockdown, we were very fortunate at Newcastle that we have a, a clinical uh, research facility that operates very much like a hospital. Um, and so we were very ready to, to make this transition to, to being as safe as we possibly could and, and remaining operational through the, the pandemic and the lockdown. We in, in, instigated a lot of different operational procedures so that we could give our participants confidence that they could come and see us in the lab um, and be safe and use that as an opportunity to, to get out of the home safely. 
we um, went through a pre-assessment phone call with every participant prior to them coming onto the unit, both for this study and every other study to check whether they'd had any symptoms or, or any close contacts. We monitored footfall in, in the unit very closely, both in terms of actual researchers, but also in terms of the patient as well, to make sure that we were operating within a, a limited capacity. We discouraged the use of public transport, so we really recommended that patients took uh, the opportunity to have private transport, such as a taxi, to bring them to the session and, and take them home again afterwards. And obviously we had to really revamp our, our cleaning and, and uh, PPE procedures, make sure that all staff were trained um, and that there was appropriate time left before and after each of the, the technical uh, validation study assessments to, to fully uh, clean down the lab and equipment. Just a few things to finish off on. So uh, recruitment was incredibly tough. I think it's important to, 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 to note that across the sites we had, we were trying to recruit patients that were clinically vulnerable and even extremely clinically vulnerable. So just even to step foot outside of the front door was, was a massive ask for these patients. So thank you to, to all of the assessors, but also to the patients as well for, for coming and giving their time. Clint's already touched upon it very briefly, but I think that it's important to note that we, we had to be a dynamic workforce. We had to be flexible and we had to be responsive. And, and those, um, those attributes were something that, that had to be in place from the very beginning, but they've been maintained ever since, ever since we started the study. Lastly, face masks um, was something that were obviously a, an important addition to the um, protocol, but we had to give it a lot of thought in terms of how that might affect somebody's vision when we're asking people to walk over obstacles, et cetera, um, and also how it affected their hearing um, and their breathing as well, particularly when we were recruiting patients with respiratory conditions. Clint's already talked a little bit about the changes to, to the home visits in terms of the protocol um, in order to, to make the whole um, the whole process much safer for, for patients and, and make sure that they were comfortable with it. Um, and lastly, just that consistency was really key. So the protocol was, was super, super complicated. Um, and you can see in the, in the image on the right hand side, my colleague Phil, who's completed the simulated uh, daily activities test. And you can see the tables and, and all of the things that were out there. So being organized and, and consistent in our approach to, to data collection was absolutely key. So without further ado, I'll, I'll move on and hand over to Ellen. Ellen, yeah. Hi there. Yes. So my name is Ellen Buckley. I work here at the, at the University of Sheffield as a research associate um, and was involved in these data collections for um, the technical validation study and now the clinical validation study, which is the next aspect of this. So um, we'll rejoin our um, patient's journey, if my slides will work. Um, and the next part that was planned was the real world assessment. So um, at the lab session that patients came to, um, the, at the end of it, they were given a McRoberts sensor. Um, this was a slim device that was worn through a Velcro elastic strap around their lower waist, uh, lower back even, and they were asked to wear it for seven days as much as possible, um, including overnight, um, but to take off for baths and showers because it's not waterproof. Um, and then they were also given a phone loaded with the Aquora app and um, beacons that were registered to their walking aids. Um, these, um, I know they've already been talked about in previous sessions, so I won't go into these too much um, just now. Um, I guess key things with this is the sensor was permitted to be taken off overnight if, um, if it was uncomfortable to the participants so that we could ensure that compliance during the day was as good as possible. Um, and then the Android phone that they were given, we tried to make them focus on that as an outdoor sensor so that um, when it came to our interviews and questionnaires, we were asking about accessibility and usability. We knew that they were in, we were really interested in the sensor rather than being distracted about the um, beacons or the phone. Um, the, obviously this being during the pandemic, um, it was all a little com um, confounded by um, the pandemic and locked up local lockdowns so but obviously this being a, a validation study we're interested in how people walk when they walk and if the devices are working and how they're working so um we just kept that as best as 
ask them to wear it and go about their life as they otherwise would. Um, the next part then, as I say, we were interested in how they found the sensor during that week. Um, and so we wanted firstly to do some questionnaires and then an interview in a subset of the patients um, to see how they found the sensor. So again, as I say, all participants completed an acceptability questionnaire based on Rabnovich in 2013. This asked them for um, their opinion on the few different themes um, and to say how often, how much they agreed with these statements um, between all the time and never. Um, and then uh, also gave them opportunity to give some free text answers to say what the features they liked, what they didn't like, if there's anything they'd improve about it, as well as asking for a score out of 100 um, so for the overall device. Um, they then all completed the comfort rating scale, which um, asked for a score between 0 and 20 um, of agreement, um, low agreement to high agreement on these um, two two phrases related to a certain theme. So I'm worried, I feel tense. Altogether, how much did they agree with that phrase? Um, and this gave all participants a chance to feedback um, on how they found that the waste-worn sensor during the week. Again, focusing on the sensor, not the phone or the beacons. We then had a subset of patients complete an activity um, complete an interview with um, assessors. So this was recorded with a dictaphone, transcribed, translated as needed, um, depending on the site. Um, and we tried to make sure that this was a, a, you know, a subset across all cohorts um, as best as possible. This um, interview had two main parts. Um, the first part about was about the McRoberts um, Dynaport Move Monitor. Um, so asking them initially their experiences of wearing it with open-ended questions so that not to lead the um, participant um, too much and allow them to discuss as they felt free to. Um, how did they feel about it? Did they like it? The attachment particularly, um, was it comfortable? Um, did, it, did they have any particular emotions around being monitored, around wearing the sensor? Um, and then following up with, um, did it influence their activities, any difficulties? And, did they, how did they feel about the idea of wearing it for seven days? Um, would longer or less time be preferred? Um, before we moved on to a second part, which was more about wearable sensors and technology and in healthcare particularly. So what, how much technology do they use in day-to-day -day life? Um, did they see the use, uh, the, the benefit to clinicians having access to that kind of data? Did they have any concerns about um, sharing that kind of data with um, various authorities. Um, and so these parts with, the, Alison's gonna share a few initial findings from these questionnaires and um, in interviews shortly. Um, but this just gave us a bit of extra information, a bit more insight into some of those answers from the questionnaire to see, um, you know, cause it's important, all these aspects are important in the eventual hopeful, hopefully in implementation of these devices in um, healthcare. So the final section then, um, and as Clint said, this did move around for certain participants um, as we needed to be flexible with it. Um, we um, visited them at home and completed um, a two and a half hours free living assessment. So we um, took with us the INDIP system that we've already talked about in previous um, webinars. And again, they had the phone and the sensor, um, the McRobert sensor around the waist and um, the beacons. Um, we essentially left them with the system recording for two and a half hours at home. So as um, this was in the pandemic, we've obviously had to make allowances and ensure social distancing at home as best as possible so that the patients and the assessors were all safe um, as best as possible. Um, and um, we gave them a series of checklists, a checklist to complete with a series of tasks in it. Obviously, two and a half hours. Some patients, if you left to their own devices, might just sit still for a few minutes, you know, or for a long while. Um, so, or they might be really active. So, but we wanted to make sure that we at least had these core tasks from every participant. So this was simple things they might already have done regardless. So rising from a chair, walking to another room, going and making a drink, going up and down stairs if possible. Obviously, if they're in a flat, that might not be. 
um, going outside, um, walking for a minimum two minutes, um, just to ensure that we had a minimum and number of walking bouts and activities completed in that two and a half hours. Um, but otherwise they were encouraged to go about their lives, what they would have done, any chores around the house kind of thing. Um, again, they had the outdoor sensor that they took out with them um, and the rest of the time were, you know, were to leave it on the side um, charging. Um, and they were given shoe covers so that the cables with the sensors were kept tidy and not disconnected accidentally. Um, and also to protect from the weather because um, by the time it came to, um, because the delay with the recruitment and the data collections, in, in Britain, sure, in Britain, it was autumn, so it was rainy weather, um, you know, not all, not as, not the nicest um, around here, so um, we wanted to protect the sensors and also ensure the patients were as comfortable as possible. Um, and again, I guess one thing with COVID was that we weren't allowed to go in some non-essential businesses, so our um, ideal idea of going and spending the time nearby working and then coming back two and a half hours meant that we were then sat in the car for two hours ducking from the rain instead so um all the challenges occasionally um came up with that kind of thing so um yeah that's essentially everything that the participants went through um at the end of of the um two and a half hours the assessors then came back uh, to collect the sensors return um ret retrieve the equipment um, but that essentially covers everything that um, the patients went through as part of the study. So I'll pass back to Gladi for a sec. Thank you, Alan. Um, thank you, all the speakers so far. I guess everyone has will have perceived the, the amount of work and emotions that has going through the, through the process. Felt like jumping back in <laughs> at the beginning of COVID listening to you guys. Uh, are there any questions from, from the audience? Uh, I haven't seen anyone come through. Uh, so we are a bit late, so that's actually uh, we, we, we can take questions on the go if they come through the chat, that, that will actually help us to keep in time. So, but please, if anyone has questions, just type them in as we go. So next one is Alison, who's going to tell us a bit about the, um, the results of the questionnaires and the evaluation of the, uh, from the user's perspective. Perfect. Alison? Thank you. I'm just checking my screen is up. Uh, yeah. Super, thank you. Um, so my name is Alison Kyo. I'm based in University College Dublin um, and my role within uh, Mobilised is as the patient and public involvement lead, um, but specifically within the TBS, um, I was looking at the human factors of this protocol with a real focus on the wearable device that we're using, but also any of the other electronic devices that we might have been using further on within the clinical validation study. So it's really important for us if we're going to send people home with devices or ask assessors to use a lot of technology in our studies that this technology is usable and acceptable to anyone that will interact with it. Um, if it's not, then we risk data loss um, as we progress within the study. So as part of the human factors, we looked at two sides of the coin. We looked at the participant side and the assessor side. And Ellen has obviously just gone through um, some of the, the, the methods that we used. But effectively, we asked anyone who was involved in the protocol about their opinions and their experiences of the tools that we would be using, um, not only in this study, but going on into the clinical study. So briefly, as Ellen has already said, um, all participants completed two questionnaires that generally looked at the acceptability of the device, um, the Mac Roberts device, which they wore around their waist, um, in terms of how it interacted with their daily activities, whether it was uncomfortable sleeping in, um, whether they were comfortable wearing it in general. Um, and then they also um, rated the general comfort of the device itself. We then looked at a sub-sample of participants in order to just dive a little bit deeper um, in order to understand their thoughts about wearable technology in general within the management of their healthcare condition. So um, I'm only going to briefly touch on these results because we've actually submitted this um, as a paper for publication, which is currently hopefully going under uh, peer review. So this is just a very quick snapshot 
of some of the high level results that we've gotten from this. So if we first of all looked at our questionnaire from Rabinovich, which was our general usability and acceptability, um, this was being measured on a scale of naught to five. So the closer to five here, the greater the acceptability of the device. And we can see here that we had an overall mean mark um, of 4.3 out of five, which indicates that the Mac Roberts device that sat on people's waist, waists was very acceptable to them to wear for the duration of the study. And you can see here that this was the same across all of the patient cohorts that we had. Similarly then for the comfort, we had a scale here of naught to 20, but this time the lower the number is, the more comfortable the device is. So um, uh, we can see here that actually the average was about um, 1.4 out of 20, which again indicates that this was a device that was exceptionally comfortable for them to wear, didn't provide them with discomfort, pain, or any sort of frustration. So this was quite good for us in terms of going on with the, the clinical validation study. In relation then to the interview results, um, we specifically looked at the device itself, and then we looked a little bit more broadly um, in, in terms of general wear, wearable devices within the management or assessment of healthcare. So um, again, we asked a little bit more in-depth questions and, and really it backed up what the questionnaires have told us. Um, the patients or the participants felt initially that the device looked like it was quite large. So they were quite worried initially that it wouldn't be very comfortable, but nearly all of them remarked that they were pleasantly surprised about the fact that they didn't notice it in their daily activities. And they also didn't notice it most importantly, um, for the most part, while they were sleeping, which was considered very important to them. They're used to the idea of things like Fitbits, which might provide you with data about the amount of steps you take. But obviously, this is not the purpose of the Mac Roberts device. It is a silent device that collects kind of more in-depth information about how people walk. So for this reason, participants weren't necessarily able to understand the direct usefulness of this device for them, but they were comfortable that it was useful for researchers. And so they were happy to continue wearing it. Um, when it came to the likelihood of wearing it for longer periods, they were happy enough to just stick with a week at a time, mainly because they didn't necessarily see a direct usefulness to them, or they could imagine that in the summer, it might become a little bit obvious underneath clothes. So they just weren't sure about how they would feel about that. However, looking a little bit more broadly, they were very open to the idea of using wearable devices to monitor any aspect of their healthcare condition going forward, um, particularly when it came to communicating with their healthcare professionals, as sometimes this is an area where they feel there's a little bit of a disconnect either between different healthcare professionals or between themselves and their healthcare professionals. So they were completely open to the idea of wearables and, and using this more often. However, they didn't necessarily see exactly what that might look like. So the meaningfulness of this to them is not there yet, simply because these aren't necessarily being used in, in practice at the moment. But they trusted that researchers and healthcare clinicians would look after their data appropriately and that um, they would were open to using this um, further on. So th this was a plus for us. It meant that we were able to turn around and say a waste worn device within the clinical validation study is completely acceptable. When we then moved across to the assessors, again, we used a mix of questionnaires and uh, interviews in order to understand how they found the protocol um, and the tools that would be used again in the clinical validation study going forward. Now, it was a little bit difficult here to separate um, people's opinions on the protocol and the difficulties of the, the technical validation protocol from the actual devices themselves, because obviously the two things are intrinsically linked. And we've already heard from Clint and from Lisa um, and, and from Ellen that there was an awful lot of difficulties associated with this protocol that were completely tied in to the COVID-19 pandemic. There was an awful lot of changes that need to be made. Um, and, and that just made what was already a complex protocol even more complex. So one thing that is worth noting is that all researchers um, were and should be very proud of the fact that we've managed to get as many participants involved in the study and to get the volume of data that we have within the context of a global pandemic. 
However, there were some things to, to note going forward, particularly for the clinical validation study. And, and some of this has been um, touched upon already, um, mainly around the issue of training. So um, as we've heard, the plan was to have a lot more face-to-face -face training um, and also to use, I suppose, um, patients as part of the training process. But COVID meant that that wasn't possible. So unfortunately, it meant that our researchers were having to effectively um, figure out how to use some of these devices on participants while they were actually there in front of them. Now, there were things that were um, done to try and prevent this, mainly the use of manuals. But because timelines were shifted with various different sites, Again, this just meant that it was being updated at different periods of time, um, which just made that a little bit more difficult. However, from a lessons learned perspective, it was really important for the researchers to highlight this because it meant that there were certain things that we could pick out that we could then implement within the clinical validation study. So one of them is the creation of this cheat sheet because as we've heard, the manuals are quite substantial. So if we have um, a sheet that basically says, this is how you um, label this type of data for this device, um, or very little kind of small quirks that are quickly and easily seen on one sheet, that was considered something that would be very useful. Similarly, what the technical validation study group did was set up a task fork of task force of weekly calls where they could learn from each other's different experiences and then adjust their um, protocols in relation to that. So again, that was brought into cl the clinical validation study. Um, and then most importantly is more piloting of the, 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 um, uh, the, the technical devices um, ahead of time was considered important and with patients if possible, because there's really nothing that can um, match, I suppose, the complexities of having people in front of you. So in summary, I suppose this is just a snapshot of some of the um, patient perspectives and the assessor's perspectives that we have. We do have an awful lot of um, work that is ongoing with our patient and public um, advisors, um, some of which is based on the results of this and some of which will be building on it a little bit more. Um, so there's an awful lot of work that will be done in this area. But as I said, this is just a snapshot to show how we have learned, I suppose, and are comfortable with the fact that a waste-worn device can be and should be implemented in the clinical validation study, but also to highlight how our assessors within the cl clinical validation study can learn from some of the experiences um, from uh, the researchers within the technical side of things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alison. Uh, I think this was very good recap of, 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 of the results and a little bit of summary of what we have seen also from the assessors. Uh, I don't see questions in the chat, so I think we can move on to Dave's presentation. And yeah. Please. Hi, everybody. Um... Hi, my name is Dave Singleton, and uh, I'm also based in UCD. Um, and my role in um, MobilizeD is in supporting Work Package 3, um, which, as it says on the slide there, is responsible for data management. So you'll be quite familiar with this uh, slide at this stage, but I guess the key point I wanted to make here is that um, the um, at the consent um, the participant is giving uh, an ID or um, pseudonym basically. So all subsequent data that's collected from this point onward then um, is pseudonymized. The only people piece of personal information or what we refer to as the study key is kept and secured locally at site. So there's no um, personal identifiable information um, captured on our annular platforms. Um, so this slide here shows the assessment flow. So we, we essentially designed the assessment flow to minimize alternating between different systems. I mean, as Clint has, has previously outlined, um, you know, this didn't always go to plan, but the idea was that we would 
start on um, one platform, try to complete all of the required assessments on that platform before moving to another, etc. So you can see in the left hand side here on the legend that we we captured data electronically, but we also captured uh, data in paper format where necessary. So for example, the informed consent was captured on paper. Um, we entered uh, information into the database to say the person was consented, but we didn't actually add that consent form which had personal information onto our platform. What we did in certain cases, as you can see in the mocker there was, we, um, we did take a copy of the paper form um, but we transcribe the information onto an electronic form on the platform. So again, when capturing paper uh, or source data on paper, then uh, we used what we call the four eyes principle to make a certified copy of that um, document and upload that to the platform. So uh, in 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 the uh, in the assessment flow, there you can see that we had a we have um, uh, a couple of. Uh, go, no go uh, points there, you know, at, at the consenting and then at the screening. But um, if the participant um, met the requirements there, they've moved through the assessments. And um, the gray represents eSign e Central, which I'll, I'll mention briefly in, in uh, upcoming slides. And then we moved on to the Clario um, platform, as you can see here, where um, the patients, uh, participants rather, conducted disease specific questionnaires. And then they moved on, ideally, to complete the, the other sessions that um, Clint, Lisa, and Ellen have, have um, described in detail. So um, this uh, slide represents the data flow. So um, as you can see, it's, uh, and as previous speakers have outlined, there was a lot of equip equipment um, deployed at, at each individual site. And um, we have, you can see we have on the left, we have patient generated data. We have the gold standard reference data from, from the labs and, and also used in the uh, two and a half hour. And then we have the investigator or um, assessor generated data there on the right hand side. And again, you can see that the data is uploaded through a number of um, different uh, media. So via tablet or laptop or phone. So again, uh, quite complex, a lot of equipment um and a lot of training and testing and validating uh, required um the information um was transferred to eSign central which is basically our data ingestion platform and again we could uh, we had some custom designed web forms and data could be entered in that way or it could be manually uploaded to a portal or we had server to server transfer um, using uh, application programming interface. So again, the, the acronyms are, are spelled out there, but essentially we used um, the Clario platform for the ECOA, which is um, electronic clinical outcome assessment. So you can have either patient reported outcomes or clinician reported outcomes. Uh, and I'll refer to those two systems on the next slides. So eSign Central is, is, um, is essentially a platform that provides software as a service and platform as a service. So it supports data management and data analysis and, and data collaboration. Um, from the previous slide, you were seeing that we created custom um, design forms. Um, so these were JSON-based web forms, um, but we could also validate these forms using JSON schema. So it meant that we could um, we could add constraints to the form, so uh, identifying minimum, maximum boundaries, etc., or making certain fields required and optional. So we had a lot of control over the um, over the input data, and the data that was captured from these forms was stored directly on in the eSign Central database. The downside of this is obviously because it's a web application that we always needed an internet connection. And, and as my colleagues have outlined, that, that wasn't always possible or was certainly intermittent at some occasions. The other platform we used was, as I mentioned, Clario's ECOA platform. Um, Clar Clario, uh, formerly known as, as ERT, certainly ERT when we started working with them. Um, but again, this is um, a, a comprehensive platform that's used in, in clinical trials worldwide, supports multiple languages, et cetera. 
So uh, a very comprehensive platform, but again, um, it's the first time we use it, a lot of training required. Clario also provides us with the hardware or the tablets to collect the information. So um, the, the eSign Central had to be used um, on a laptop. The ERT application, as I said, was available on tablet or there was a backup on the web. So you had two different platforms there. We were capturing most of the patient characterization information. Um, the, the benefit of the Clario tablet is that you could, you could go offline after you create the patient on this because it could store and forward information and later synchronize with the Clario backend. It, we had minimum use, I guess, of Clario in the TVS, but it was certainly a good dry run for um, a lot more comprehensive use in the clinical validation study. Um, so this is just a list of the data formats, uh, different data formats. So uh, it, it captures all of the um, source data generation. Um, as you can see, the formats for, for all are really open formats. Um, and most of the data is stored on eSign Central is based on uh, Amazon Web Services. So it's stored on Amazon Storage Platform S3. Um, and as I said, all of the information that you we captured, as you saw in the data flow diagram, is all um, then stored on eSign Central as the sort of central data ingestion platform. Um, so uh, as part of the design of the systems, um, we, um, we made an effort to comply with Alcoa principles. So these are best practice guidelines and methodologies for, for good data management defined by the US Food and Drug Administration. So um, the acronym stands for, as you can see, attributable, legible, contemporaneous, and accurate. Um, so, you know, for attributable, we had a user ID associated with all data uploads. Um, all uploads were legible, as you saw from the previous data formats. Uh, and contemporaneous, we had timestamps associated with all data captures. Um, in terms of originality, then we had uh, primarily electronic data, but where it was paper data at source, then we made certified copies of that and uploaded to the, to the ingestion platform. And in terms of accuracy, we had error checking on the all of the inputs. Um, and we did further error checking then in, in the transfer of the data, which I'll show you shortly. Um, so Alcoa was extended then for, for and called Alcoa Plus or Alcoa CCA. And, and these uh, principles are basically referred to the, the uh, completeness of your data set and, and the consistency of the data within and, and whether that data can be made uh, available um, and for long periods of time. So um, again, this long-term storage and availability is part of uh, Mobilize D's um, exploitation strategy, which is currently on, on, on the review. So overall, in terms of data integrity, then the um, so the data is only entered into the platform in coded, coded or de-identified format. As I said, the study code is, study code is held locally. The um, we only had role-based access control, so only allowed authorized users. Um, electronic data captured at source mainly. All of those I, I previously mentioned. We also had a file naming convention for any manual uploads. Um, and again, we had the input controls at source on both eSign Central and, and Clario. We have a, an ETL process to extract the data, transform it and load it into the data warehouse. And that included additional integrity checking and, and error reporting. And then we regularly reviewed reports on compliance and completeness. So looking at missing or, or duplicate data. Also, the other thing to note is with the help of all my colleagues who previously presented and, and many more, any changes that were required were always made on the source platform and a data change request was required um, to approve that change. So challenges, um, as some of I've mentioned, it's a complex protocol required um, training, a lot of testing and iterations uh, um, with the different sites. We had multiple data sources to support. It was the first time we actually designed a, a study on the Clario uh, Eco platform. Um, uh, our eSign Central forms had limited capability, but they were flexible because we managed them in-house. The Clario tablet was locked down to just Clario's application, so we couldn't share um, any other applications on that platform. 
Um, we had difficulty in licensing some of the instruments we use, or at least it was quite time consuming getting authorization for copyright holders, etc. And as mentioned uh, previously, COVID-19 had a major impact on uh, the recruitment and obviously data management as a result. So the key lessons learned then, um, we implemented a new user interface for eScience Central. These were all carried forward into the clinical validation study. Um, we worked with, ER, with ERT slash Clario to, um, to share their platform. So both eScience Central and ERT were used on the same tablet, which uh, obviously reduced the, um, the issues that we had in the TVS. We introduced visit notes to capture additional information. Um, we did full user acceptance testing of the platforms. We engaged early with the licensed copyright holders. Some of our consortium uh, members supported our licensing and translation services, as there were a lot more um, instruments used in the clinical validation study. And we also took a note out of the uh, leaf out of the TVS book in terms of the training webinars and again um, created those and made those available on internally on SharePoint. Um, the, we had multiple sensors introduced in the clinical validation study. So again, we had a naming convention which we changed to include that sensor type. Uh, and finally, the, um, we used the same pipeline for the different sensors in, in the clinical validation study, which really supports our sensor agnostic approach in, in mobile OSD. Uh, we carried forward the, the task force and established that early in the CBS, as Alison has outlined, because it was so successful in the technical validation study. And that's my last slide. Thank you very much. I'll hand you over to Kirsty. Hi there. Uh, everyone hear me okay? Good. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to be relatively quick, uh, obviously, as we're kind of slightly behind. Um, so in regards to what we've all looked at um, for now, we've obviously went through this patient journey where we have, um, oh, sorry, um, we have this full um, journey pipeline that we have from consent all the way through to our two and a half hour living. Um, so what I'd like to do now is really just go into each of these segments um, and see what we've actually managed to collect, which um, even with all the challenges that we had, um, I think we, we've done a very good job. So um, the first one is, looking at the consent in the screening. So in regards to the actual amount of participants that we collected, originally for each of the cohorts, um, as well as the older healthy adults, we wanted to look at a sample size of 20 um, based on a power calculation that was done previously. Then halfway during the data collection, we then performed another sample size recalculation. So that number did decrease for some of the patient groups um, based on the number of walking bouts that we had. Um, so I'm pleased to say that we have completed the data collection for um, five of the site, uh, five of the cohorts that we have. Um, we're still slightly under for our congestive heart failure. However, we do have some participants that may be looking to join us before we close um, our study in April. Um, overall, I think that this is a, a very strong effort from all the teams that are involved, particularly with this, the, the primary part of this recruitment going ahead during the COVID pandemic. Um, so I think even with those numbers, we, we need to be proud of what we've done. Um, in regards to the participant characterization as well, I think it's um, important to note that for each of the clinical cohorts that we had, we did get a very good range in regards to their clinical scoring. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details, but just to say that we got from uh, participants that had mild symptoms all the way through to more severe, um, with obviously still having the ability to walk. In addition, we also um, had a, a good range within the walking aid users, um, so at least one for each cohort, um, particularly more for, for the ones where we would expect to see walking aid users. Um, and as a general, we have 25 within the, 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 the participant um, grouping that we have that used walking aids, um, which again, we'll, we'll come back to our um, validation of our algorithms um, and looking at walking aid versus non-walking aid. In regards to the in-lab assessment, even giving all the um, issues that we, we could have had with our technical requirements, um, again, we did a very, very good job. We have data sets for all of the participants that we collected data on. Um, out of the 107, we have 102 
fully complete data sets, which means that for every single task that we did, we have all of the sensors that we expect to have. Um, for those five that we don't, um, it doesn't mean that we don't have any data. It just means that for certain tasks, there might have been a technical issue with one of the technologies that we used. Um, so I think a 95% success in complete data sets is, is a, big, uh, a big achievement um, for such a complex protocol. In regards to the actual trials that we were able to collect in the lab, um, as uh, Lisa mentioned previously, what we did is we went through tasks that went from kind of easier um, motor task assessments through to com complex assessments like that simulated daily activities. Obviously, giving um, consideration to the fact that we had such a variation in the cohorts and also in the disease progression and the severity, there was some participants that weren't able to complete those um, more complex tasks, which is what we expected anyway. Um, but in general, we have 90% completion of all the tasks that we, we, we would have expected for at the start. Um, I'm going to go a bit more into the details of that later, though. In regards to the real world assessment, so the seven day assessment, um, based on what Alison's already told you um, about the, the questionnaires and the interviews, we had um, complete acceptability of using the sensor for seven days. Um, so all of our participants were willing to wear it and did for the seven day assessment. Um, as well as the um, lower back sensor, we obviously had the outdoor sensor, which was the Acora app on the phone, um, which for some cases within certain participants, we didn't have as much compliance. Um, but if that's something that you're interested in looking at, I would suggest going back to um, session two the experimental tools where um, we discuss that in a little bit more detail about those challenges and limitations that we had with that specific technology in this assessment. Um, but more than anything, it was just based on location of the participants and the majority of them being inpatients within hospital settings. In regards to the two and a half hour assessment, um, again, we have full completion um, of all the data. So we've collected data sets for all of the participants. Um, and the complete data sets were sitting at 98%. So again, this is taking into any uh, taking into consideration any possible technical complications that we had when collecting the data. So that only really makes up for two of the data sets that we have um, with, within our, our full um, participant list, which as, as much as you know, we're, we're saying that it has been very complicated, and I, I have no doubt it definitely has been complicated. I think we've managed to do a very good job, um, even with all the, the challenges that we had. So now that we have all this uh, data, um, obviously the, the, the initial task is to go ahead with the technical validation. So looking at the DMOs, um, the algorithm bases for the single sensor that we have around the waist, using all of these protocols and all of the um, reference systems and the experimental tools that we've used. But also something else that we'd like to do is just validate the protocol itself um, to make sure that we've achieved what we wanted to achieve um, based on the assessments that we defined. So as um, Lisa's already mentioned, we had multiple tasks within the lab um, that ranged from relatively easier tasks to definitely more complex tasks with variations in um, turnings and motor tasks as well. So when we were um, first considering how to create this protocol within the lab, we had certain criteria that we wanted to meet. The first was making sure that the patient was at the center um, of the design. So making sure that patient safety and well-being um, was first priority. Um, then considering the technical requirements that we have. So if you were um, there for session one um, of the, the webinar series, you'll see that we have specific definitions on how we calculate DMOs, um, which is based on having two consecutive strides of the same leg. Um, so making sure that we had enough of a walking period to be able to actually calculate a walking bout, um, which in a lab-based setting, which is quite um, restricted, can be quite difficult. Um, and then thirdly, making sure that we have complexity um, and ranges within our walking strategies, which are representative of what we would expect in the real world environment. So again, including all these additional tasks um, and additional functions within the, 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 the protocol that we had. Um, 
So, oh, sorry, just to mention as well that the, the initial data that I'm going to show you just now, it doesn't include our congestive heart failure group um, just because that's an ongoing data collection. So the first point, as I said, in regards to participant safety and well-being, we went through this easy to complex with each of the tasks. Um, and we can see in this table here, green highlights that we have 100% completion across the cohort and yellow is above 70% completion. Um, and as we expect, as the tasks get more complicated, um, they're, they're, that's at the point where people are not able to complete those tasks, which is what we were expecting. Um, what was quite um, an additional surprise was with the hip fracture, the conditional um, straight walking that we had, slow and fast, um, we also had a couple, uh, one participant that wasn't able to complete that, but um, I guess it's to do with the self-regulation of walking um, within that cohort. When we looked at the technical requirements, making sure that we could actually calculate the BMOs based on the, the protocol that we set. Um, again, 100% means that we were able to calculate BMOs for all of the tasks. Uh, yellow is above 70% and uh, the, the slightly orange one is above 50%. Um, and again, we, we did well. Um, we did notice, though, that obviously for the patients that are more, more mobile and then walk faster um, and possibly have longer stride lengths, we were missing that information for the faster walking con conditions. Um, and that's just due to the fact that we had a five minute um, pathway for them, which um, for some participants is just going to be too short. Um, so that's definitely something that we would take into consideration um, again. But again, we were working within the technical environment that we had, which was a lab based setting with a very specific area um, of uh, capture. In regards to the complexity of the walking strategies and the ranges that we were seeing, um, what we've done as an initial kind of analysis is look at the average walking speed for each walking bout. So the average walking speed for each task for each cohort. Um, and what we can see here is we have a distribution plot for each of the cohorts. The um, colors represent the specific tasks um, over that distribution plot that we have. So looking at the, the, the walking speed ranges as well as how it distributes for each participant group. And as we can see, the, the ranges are slightly different for each one, um, but we do cover a good range even just within this lab-based protocol, um, which is, is great, great news for us. Um, in addition to this, obviously, when we're talking about ranges of walking speed, it's good to know that we do have a large amount of range within the lab, but it's interesting to also know how, is, how comparable is that to the real world environment. Um, so some kind of preliminary analysis we're doing at the moment is comparing the distribution of the average walking speeds for the two and a half hour free living and comparing that to the in lab. Um, and the nice thing is, is that we, again, we can see that the ranges are actually relatively quite similar between this protocol that we had and this two and a half hour assessment. And um, obviously the distribution is much higher, the frequency is much higher for the two and a half hour, but we are covering the, the kind of almost the lower and the, the upper extremities of the, the ranges of the walking speeds. Um, which means that when we're using our official gold standard, the motion capture system, um, and the, the comparison to the, 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 the single sensor and the algorithms, um, we, we can take into consideration those slower walking speeds, which we would expect in the real world as well. So I do apologize. It has been quite quick going through. Um, but just to say that this um, additional validation of the protocol that we're doing is work in progress. Um, if you are more interested, interested in learning more and how things develop, um, I will be presenting at the ISPGR um, in Canada this year um, and also the World Congress of Biomechanics. So all I say is watch this space. Um, and I think that that'll set us up quite nicely for what's going to come next week as well. So um, I hope we have some time for some questions and answers. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you, Kirsty. That's okay. So, um, and, and everyone else, of course. So I guess we, I hope we've managed to bring uh, across the, the, the message of what we did exactly with, with, with our patients. Uh, so of course, we, again, this was a very complex protocol. So even just having to, 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 to provide all the details is absolutely not an easy job. So thanks to all of our speakers for, 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 for having been brilliant at this. Um, there have been a few questions uh, that have been answered in the chat uh, concerning the, the, the sense of wearing and the and, and, and 
how we, how the, the patients were were were, uh, were reacting to that. There was just um, the, which reminded me something that I wanted to stress, which is the fact that really everything we are doing here and the reason why we, we designed this protocol and 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 and, and all this. Uh, multiple assessment is because we, we really want to try and and uh, challenge our algorithms as much as possible. So all those funny tasks and all those uh, complex uh, complex uh, way of measuring gait were not uh, uh, just our way to torture the patients, but were really uh, for us the way to try and challenge our algorithms as much as possible. Uh, and just like, for example, there was a question around what happens if the patients were the sensors upside down, and that's something else that in the algorithms we have to uh, account for, because of course it's something that, that happens and might, might happen. Um, so I don't see other questions coming through, so I think we can, uh, we can close the session here. So the next episode will be around uh, all the tools that we are using that they've already mentioned. In, uh, so how we are transferring and processing the data, uh, our data platform, and, 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 and how we will be running the algorithms on this data. Uh, and, and that will be in two weeks. So hopefully uh, there will be more, more opportunities to, to, to share with you uh, what, what we have learned from this, uh, from this technical validation study. So thanks everyone again for joining and hopefully see you all in two weeks. And thanks again to all of our speakers, not just for today, but for all the effort through the, uh, through the data collection and analysis. Thank you.